Hi everyone, I'm Avek, and I'm going to be talking about a new deep learning framework that I've been working on called LUX, which is essentially an explicit parameterization of neural networks. So what exactly is explicit parameterization? Firstly, let us see what implicit parameterization is. So in this example, we can see that we are calling psycho.gradient with a function which literally takes no arguments. So we are essentially taking the gradients of a function with no argument which makes very little semantic sense. But in this case, what Zygote does is it tracks the parameters of the model automatically and just computes the gradient with respect to those. So this is essentially known as implicit parameterization. Now for LUX, what we do is we explicitly specify what the trainable and non-trainable variables of the model are. So if you see the LUX.setup set, is, uh, set of function, that's what it does. It specifies the trainable variables and the non-trainable variables. Next in the zygote call, you have to explicitly pass in what the parameters are with, res with respect to which you want the gradients. So we are essentially asking zygote to not do anything smart and just use the parameters that we are passing in. This is a more general approach because it not only works with zygote, but it works with all other AD frameworks like Enzyme, or reverse diff. Now, so it essentially seems like Lux is basically a more complicated API for Flux, but that's not really the case. Lux offers a lot more functionality. First of all, it's a functional by convention framework, which means there are absolutely no mutations which cycle up Lux. Next, you have a decoupled state and architecture, which means you do not have branches during runtime. For example, let's say you have a batch norm or dropout layer, which uh, which operates under different uh, conditions and during runtime and, and sorry, during training and inference. So when we are compiling the code, we can essentially uh, check if it's going to be uh, run for training or for inference, and we can eliminate an entire chunk of code during compilation. Additionally, it makes you think really hard about what your parameters and states are, and by explicitly making you specify those, which uh, is a better mental model, in my opinion. Additionally, it's very easy to serialize. If your serialization uh, supports name tuples with arrays, uh, it should be able to serialize any Lux model. Finally, it also composes out of the box with non-machine learning frameworks like differential equations, but we'll talk about this a bit more later on. First of all, what Lux allows us parameter manipulation, which is extremely easy. You might uh, think why Flux doesn't really have weight norm or spectral norm, any other kind of layer which manipulates parameters. First of all, it's uh, it, the Flux's design makes it kind of impossible to implement these. Uh, for example, in PyTorch, you would do layer.param equals to the new updated value, but Flux's layers are immutable while PyTorch classes are not. You could probably do layer.param dot equals, which would update the parameters in place, but Zyko doesn't support mutation, so, you're, uh, so this approach is hopeless. In Lux, however, you could just update the new, get the new parameters, wrap it in a name tuple, pass it into the uh, now into the next layer and it just works. Uh, we also do, so we have like default support for these layers in the core framework. Another interesting property is that Lux is completely agnostic to the parameter structure, which means you can have any weird uh, storage for your parameters, but as long as the GRET property is correctly implemented, it just works. Uh, let's look at an example. So let's say you're, you want to implement a new structure for the parameters of logs.dance, which essentially require weight and bias. You could have a structure which contains my weight and my bias. And if you're queried with weight, you just pass in my weight. And if you're queried with bias, you just pass in my bias. Now, you should not be really doing this, but this just shows you how flexible Lux is in terms of the parameters and also leads to some other interesting properties. Uh, now coming to flat parameter vectors. Flat parameter vectors are not very common in machine learning, but in any other kind of optimization packages, differential equations, you will see that they're widely used. 
So how does Flux compose with those frameworks? It uses something called destructure, which uh, essentially takes a nested model and uh, creates a flat parameter vector and also an, a function to reconstruct the original model. But it's very hard to implement correctly. And you, if you check GitHub, you'll see a lot of issues regarding this. It's, it has a lot of edge cases which are really hard to handle. By allowing a flexible parameter structure, we, by default, support something called a component array. We can, it can take an essentially uh, nested uh, tuple, which contain parameters, uh, uh, and you just pass it into a component array, which will construct a flat vector out of it. And you can essentially use it for, it, it's essentially an abstract array, so it can be used with uh, all of the non-ML frameworks. As an example, DFQ Flux was able to like shift to using Lux in less than a week. So now let's come to the, another question as to why not just upstream these to Flux. Uh, there are multiple reasons. Firstly, it's a massive breaking change. Like there has been a lot of discussions about this kind of parameterization, and it would be a huge burden on the users to just tr uh, translate their Flux code. So you just having a separate package just makes it easier. Next, it's not really uh, clear uh, whether decoupling is very user-friendly. If you just compare the statistics of PyTorch versus Jackstream, which you would see PyTorch is way ahead. So users do actually prefer somewhere to have those things com uh, composed. Additionally, Flux and Lux are essentially very opinionated front-ends to a um, core Julia deep learning ecosystem. So uh, both of them actually benefit from equally benefit from uh, the underlying improvements in the underlying core frameworks. Uh, now coming to the question, you might have a lot of Flux code. So how do you essentially migrate to Lux? If you're using standard Flux layers, uh, I've kept the API very close to Flux. So you, you can just change using Flux to using Lux and uh, most of the things should work. But let's say you have custom layers. If you're willing to put in more effort and rewrite it in functional form, which in my opinion is significantly better, uh, and wrap it in a Lux layer, that's the ideal way to go. But let's say you love your code too much and do not want to change it. Uh, you can actually use a destructure API. It's not horrible, and it should work in most cases. Uh, and you can just wrap it in a Lux layer, and you can basically follow this guide uh, in the tutorials. Finally, even though it's a very new framework, which has been around for around just two week, uh, two months, sorry, uh, we still have quite a large ecosystem. For example, if you let's say need computer vision models uh, like pre-trained ResNets, you can use this framework called Bolts. You also have things like vision transformers. Let's you need neural differential equations. DFQ Flux does support Lux at this point. Maybe you want to train infinitely deep neural networks. Uh, you can use this package called Deep Equilibrium Networks, which again uses Lux. So that's it for my talk. Uh, hope you enjoyed it, and thanks.